Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, The Man in the Middle. This is a short history of the Black community's battle with big tech and government surveillance. My name is Alexis Hancock. I am the Director of Engineering at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps to protect your digital liberties online. It's been around for a little over 30 years. And I've been a technologist for about 10. So I've been everything from web developer, web developer to sysadmin to software engineer, one, two, three, all of those things at different companies and nonprofits and agencies. Uh, I currently manage two open source projects, CertBot and HTTPS Everywhere, under the Encrypt the Web Initiative at EFF. I also create security education content when I can and also give security trainings when I can. Uh, I also research digital identity technology, internet security policy, especially as it pertains to government network surveillance and censorship, and occasional mobile security research, especially on Android. So the background to this um, was in 2019. I had just finished reading this book in particular and had a few questions about how did we successfully circumvent surveillance and organize with each other um, between not only plantations, but different, you know, community pockets over time, all the way through Jim Crow, when we were under such heavy surveillance by the government, even to this day, we still are in many different respects, especially if you are involved with Black Lives Matter in any way, respect, shape, or form, you're probably being, have been, you know, or known someone who's targeted by surveillance in some way. And I will tie all of that to modern times from this period where I had questions, especially since the story goes over um, Maroons in particular, or the American Maroons. We know about the Maroons in Jamaica. A lot of people may know about the revolution of Haiti when they had liberated themselves from slavery, but not much is said it besides, you know, the Nat, Nat Turner Rebellion or, you know, Harper's Ferry Rebellion and those different bigger events. But those bigger events were all led up to the smaller events of rebellion and resistance and those smaller networks that were created outside of plantations where enslaved people had ran away and freed themselves and actually lived within miles of the plantation that they ran away from to stay connected with family. And so they were able to traffic information between plantations with this network, especially with um, enslaved Africans that were a little bit more mobile, like boatmen, ferrymen, uh, cargo carriers and such of uh, people who were allowed to at least go plantation to plantation and they were very pivotal in that network of communication be between plantations since they couldn't read and write they had to pretty much use their voice and so they had to use a lot of um, verbal cues and communication and I think the most prevalent example of this is probably the Underground Railroad like we're all familiar with that but that was these actions were like the precursor to help build something like the Underground Railroad because we were already kind of in practice with that. Um, and then this book confirmed to me something that was very important that, you know, enslaved, being enslaved during this time was such a traumatic situation for a mass group of people who spoke different languages, you know, and, and were able to come together and actually create a new language, Creole and others. Um, that were similar in dialect. And also the fact that they never gave their enslavers a night of sleep, like never. And it was, you know, it's not so much as comforting, but it's a it's a fact that this book portrays where it's like they had to outsmart them all the time, um, their enslavers, um, the people who were overseers, the people who were plantation owners, like they never really got to rest while they enacted this horrible system on this group of people. And I'm glad they never got rest, you know, <laughs> you know, I didn't, and you don't want th these type of people to sleep at, at night and they never gave them a wink of sleep. There was always a rebellion. There was always something in question. And this book kind of paints that picture of the fact that this type of system uh, was not easy to maintain because people were always organizing, always communicating with each other, despite the fact that, all odds were against them. Terrain, language, written communication, you know, this book kind of highlights that really powerful story behind the scenes of not just, you know, defeat, but large amounts of triumph in a, in a way, because, you know, we're still here because of them. And a lot of this too was about, you know, the fact that hacker history and stuff doesn't really get told in tandem with Black history. And I think there's definitely 
particular reasons for that. But I try to group in certain types of situations like wiretapping in the U in the United States and, and the development of the telecommunications technology we use today. So wiretapping and public opinion on wiretapping was largely shaped by how it was being used. And so the first major case of talking about how law enforcement was using wiretapping was Olmstead versus United States. Olmstead was a bootlegger. Um, this was during the time of pro prohibition. And they had deployed wiretapping against his ring of importing liquor and shipping it around. So found out that this wiretapping happened and Olmstead said that his fourth and fifth amendment rights were violated. And this case in the Supreme Court had determined that his fourth and fifth rights were not violated. This was later overturned by a different case, Katz versus United States, I believe, but that was decades later. But this particular case in 28, um, 1928, was very important in terms of shaping public opinion on why law enforcement wanted to wiretap and, and saying like, hey, look, the moral fabric of America is in danger. And, and this terminology and this usage of moral fabric and public safety gets used a lot when talking about law enforcement and wiretapping. And then you go into 40s, which was, you know, that was during wartime. And a lot of uh, secret communications tactics were developed during that time of war. And then you push forward into the 50s and 60s. And I point out this particular movie called the called Wiretapper. It was based off a, a really real person uh, named Jim Vaughn, Jim Voss, sorry. And Jim Voss used to be more engaged with criminal activities and then later on helped the police to wiretap because he had very innovative devices he would create where they didn't even need to break and enter in order to wiretap. So they called on him and then this movie was kind of created based off his character and his story because he later on converted to being a Christian. And there's even, I think the movie ends on a Billy Graham speech. If you're familiar with Billy Graham and um, televangelist type um, days. So this all kind of pushed wiretapping into like you can he used it for good and, and wiretapping is almost like an act of god uh in order to uh increase morality in the united states and maintain you know safety and morality and then you had in 1968 where that same language of morality and safety gets pushed into the omnibus crime and control crime control and safe streets act where a particular senator uh senator mcclellan from Arkansas, he was a Democrat and a staunch segregationist, and he had pushed for this act to have provisions for law enforcement to be able to wiretap because he wanted to stop the extremist groups out there who were, uh, and extremist groups also including, you know, anyone involved with the civil rights movement, whether to be Black Panther or not, um, to, to be investigated without, you know, warrant you know have a warrantless search with wiretapping without being notified without being um served a warrant so this act was very pivotal in that case where i, I, don't, I don't even believe that the senator even knew about cointel pro at the time that wasn't declassified until later because the fbi was already doing warrantless wiretapping by 68 like we all sort of know that but this act kind of put it in the public light and put it on the books as a very legal thing to do rather than a behind the scenes operation by the fbi and there was a lot of adjacent public sentiments that came along with extremist Black groups. It was also a lot of Red Scare tactics of, you know, getting organized crime. There was even a lot of, um, you know, push to catch gamblers and 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 even other like mob crime, stuff like that, to actually deploy wiretapping on other organized crime and kind of like reel in um, these groups through wiretapping and showing these cases as like, see, look, this is a good example of wiretapping, and this is why we need to do this. And so tracking back to 1964 and the type of technology that the Black community used at the time in order to organize, in order to get information out there was radio and phone. So radio is most often used for public information, and phone lines uh, were used for communication between civil rights organizations. And so this goes into AT&T or the colloquialism, uh, the, the term Ma Bell, if you remember he hearing that term growing up, where Ma Bell was the monopoly, the AT&T um, dominated telecommunications from. 
1877 to 1983. That's over a century. So they were just one entity that the police could go to and ask, okay, we need a wiretap. And, you know, there was no other companies go through to at the time. It was just them. And you still see remnants of the bell system today because AT&T still exists today, today, even after the antitrust big breakup. So they're still doing fine. <laughs> and then you have bell system breakup and it was kind of like kept this naming convention of bell so pacific bell southern bell southern bell was very much so involved in a lot of the the issues with the civil rights movement being wiretapped and so even after the breakup it was still an issue uh at&t from 1960 to 1975 to push in a little bit of phone free history um they were aware about blue boxes in 1961 if you're not aware what blue boxes are, they are multi-frequency communication devices that um, mimic that dial tone numbers that you hear and were able to get free phone calls, essentially. And phone freaks were very into this device during this time, especially through 64. It was very popular then. And they ran mass recordings, they being AT&T, to detect this toll fraud. But they didn't really want to admit to um publicly say like hey we're, we're recording without consent and they didn't want a lot of heat on them so they had a very cozy relationship with law enforcement to make sure that you know i guess the heat was off of them because they look we are helping the police catch the bad guys so they you know allowed them to wiretap tap whenever warrantless search whenever on phone calls and in exchange it kind of kept antitrust at bay because they were pretty much seen as friends of the law and it didn't keep it long for that long it keep it off for that long you know because in 83 they were broken up but still they were still um very much so involved with uh keeping their power in this way of of forging their relationship with the law which became turbulent in the 90s but I will get to that point a little bit later. And so a particular type of um, phone line that was used by civil rights organization was called Wide Area Telephone Service or Watts Phone Lines. They were the precursor to 800 numbers. Back then, long distance, even through the 90s, was still considered pretty expensive. And even then during the 60s, 50s and 60s, like county to county calls were billed as long distance. So if you had an NWATS phone line that your company or organization paid for, anyone making that call to that phone line would, um, it would be for free for them and you would have to pay, pay a flat monthly fee to maintain that line. So organizations with WATS lines were SNCC, uh, CORE, COFO, SCLC, or organizations that we probably are very familiar with in passing of learning about civil rights organizing and and they use these lines in order to get information out there fast between each other. And now it actually have like something called Watts reports, which is widely documented. And you can see like the, the list dump online of Watts reports from different organizations and how they were able to communicate with each other. They had a format for these things um, and they were intaken usually by black women on the phones 24 seven, the, these lines were open. So they were taken in shifts, very, very organized work on getting information out there in between each other. So traditional, oops, sorry, traditional phone pairing, uh, you know, you would go through a switchboard operator at the time. This is when things were a little bit more manual and that switchboard operator was usually a white woman. And if that particular person wasn't really uh, sympathetic to the civil rights movement, in any way, shape, or form, and knew that you were trying to make a call to, like, say, Kofo, they could just end the call, drop the call, and the other person on your end would never receive the information. And often they would po possibly tip off law enforcement in the area, too, saying that, you know, there's a high mass volume of requests going to this organization for a particular reason. You might want to watch out for this organization. So this was often unprompted, uh, you know, relationship with the law at the time to capture activity by civil rights organizations. And so with phone calls in Watts, what ended up happening was you could bypass the switchboard operator and directly call the organization. Now that did not stop wiretapping, but a lot of coded language was used to kind of confuse the police and it would buy them enough time because Watts phone lines weren't necessarily for, um, I would say, communications for long-term events or things it was to get quick information out there so while they're trying to figure out what these what this coded language meant 
they could get the information to the organization even if they were being recorded because the important thing was making sure that the other person or the organization knew what was going on. And so the ways that the FBI wiretapped during COINTELPRO, they would just do like dragnet records of tapped phone lines of either through the company and they would have like a pair number with um the cable connecting to the FBI in in the field office or they would do install microphones like on the target's home device. So what ended up happening there was wiretaps were a lot more easier to accomplish because they didn't need to enter a target's home, even though that was fairly easy to do most times anyway, but wiretaps were just more convenient. So there was interference a lot with, you know, organizations. And this was actually a Watts report that had talked about how a COFO office was denied installation of a, a phone from a local telephone company because what ended up happening here was during this time, um, a lot of people um, didn't exactly own the phone. Think about it as like internet service providers and the way they provide modems, but it's not your modem in particular. You just rent it out and you could use your own modem and your own router if you knew how to like pair it up with your system and had the know-how to configure it. But a lot of people just accept the modem router device that's from their ISP today and just run it out. So it's kind of like the same system here where you would get a phone from the Bell system and it would say like property of Bell system under, under the phone, like embossed under the phone. So it's kind of like the same relationship. So they could deny um, installing their device, even though any telephone probably could have done pretty well, but it had to be a, a telephone established by the company. Um, so this watch report was interesting to see like kind of how this was going on still, how unprompted by law enforcement, <laughs> different entities like the telecommunications companies were still interfering with the civil rights movement. And, you know, uh, if you're familiar with the cybersecurity term, you know, man in the middle or monster in the middle attacks used to be very literal during this time where, you know, clan night riders and such would, you know, be out here and actually um, attack different organizations, burn down buildings, things of that nature, or even kill someone. You know, these WASP reports get really dark. Some of it gets a little light where it's like, okay, um, someone was doing a protest to someone was denied admission somewhere to a car you know, being lit on fire outside someone's home to someone showing up missing or dead. It was very dark stuff. So this information was important to get out quickly. And that was the main goal of Watts phone lines. And it literally saved lives. And so going back to like a small take on radio really quickly, um, radio was very important too, because it got out public information quickly to a lot of people. And so voter education, especially um, when people weren't really quite aware of how to register or how to circumvent the dangers that involved with registering to vote, because it was very high dangers on that where people were getting threatened. So this information was sent out. There's like, hey, watch out for this group on this corner. Or, hey, there's these police blocks. Then they would code it language would come in again saying traffic, you know, jams or something like that in order to kind of, you know, give the feeling that they weren't necessarily guiding anything with protests, but still giving that indicator to the community. And Black-owned radio stations were definitely interfered with as well, but they did sustain during this time. And so you had, this is like picture illustrates from um, a really good book that I also read called Radio and the Struggle for Civil Rights in the South by Brian Ward. And this picture is from that book where it, it kind of described the relationship between WERD Atlanta, um, Black-owned radio, and SCLC office sharing the same building. So that was a very, very um, a great visual indicator of like what the relationship looked like at this time, despite the, the barriers and the issues. And so I want to talk about really quickly the permanent systems from times of fear. So you have crime, you know, being, you know, you have to stop crime. You have to stop socialists or commies, like during the Red Scare tactics, during like the labor movement. And then, you know, the language shifts to a war on something, war on drugs, war on terror, um, war, war on nouns, but it was very much war on people. And so when you talk about war, 
this is a very specific case of wartime, you know, tactics and things that wouldn't normally be deployed during, say, times of quote unquote peace. Um, war on drugs, you know, had entire organizations created like DEA, War on Terror, you had a DHS, and then subsequent organizations out of the DHS like TSA and ICE. And you know, you have all of this language that sort of justify creation of systems and also justified um, immense amounts of a warrantless search in different areas. And even you, even if you push on towards today, you'll have things like the Patriot Act, right? Um, that definitely was invoked to just bypass all means of like warrants or any sort of procedure or due process. So you look at this language shifting to war on a noun, but it's very much so beyond that. It's not about the drugs. It wasn't about the terror itself. It was about monitoring or justifying a group of people. And it would be justified if it was just like, oh, we're just catching the bad guys. But then you see something like the war on terror, where it goes from trying to sur surveil bad guys to just monitoring mocks wholesale wiretapping mass communications and then you really have to question you know who is framed as the person perpetuating the fear and who is the entity trying to push towards even more violation of privacy and rights so it's really hard to come back from this type of thing where you're establishing permanent systems during times of like immense amount of like fear for public safety and we really do have to check ourselves during these times of fear on what are we pushing for exactly when we ask for certain solutions to things. And so I wanna talk about really quickly a case that the FBI had used to try to expand wiretapping beyond just requesting telecommunications. So uh, a lot of you may be uh, familiar with the case um, that happened where there was like this huge crackdown on computer hackers in the early nineties and you know, groups like Masters of Deception and such were like brought in, they were wiretapped um, for their communications as well. And then what ended up happening is like the FBI got involved, wiretapped them and said, look, like this case was successful because we caught th the bad guys. We caught the computer hackers and we did it through wiretapping. So therefore every device in any home should be installed with some sort of wiretapping mechanism that we can just tap into ad hoc. And that was a really extreme request that the Electronic Frontier Foundation had spoke on. Um, Mike Godwin at the time was staff counsel and had talked about it with the actual uh, representative um, with the FBI who had problems with um, EFF's take on denying um, the FBI's request to do this. And the telecommunications companies weren't really uh, too to hype about this either. So it was really interesting to kind of see them finally sort of fight back for once. And this is post antitrust breakup. So this was not as much money and resources to do this stuff. So this type of wiretapping was getting a little expensive and installing device on everybody's phone was probably very expensive. So I'm going to go ahead and say it was more about money than privacy from the telecommunication standpoint. But this is kind of like the precursor to what's going on today with the FBI too. So I wanted to talk about that. So today you have backdoors on encryption or the requests from the FBI for backdoors on encryption. Um, once again, large companies like Apple, Google, who, you know, dominate iOS, dominate the, the creation of Android, and especially with iPhone, since they, um, Apple controls the operating system and the manufacturing um, of the phone. FBI went to Apple many times to tell them, like, hey, give us a key that will allow us to tap into phones ad hoc. And so far, they have denied them this. Um, but this is yet another private company that's left up to their own whims on why they would say no or not. Thankfully, a lot of public pressure has been put on Apple to uphold their word. But then you see that the FBI is like labeling encryption as a barrier to good police work. Like this is not giving us a key to see people's communications uh, ad hoc is is not good for our own um, work and not being able to catch the bad guys, even though the FBI has been fully capable of um, being able to do this without needing to break encryption tools for everyone. Uh, there's a recent story that came out in Motherboard by Vice about how uh, they had a whole operation that that pushed out, you know, fake encrypted messaging apps that actually was secretly managed by the FBI called Enam. And so they are able to do police work without breaking encryption for everyone. 
And that's not the main point here because the fact that now bad guys aren't the only ones using encryption. It's journalists, it's activists. And if we don't have encryption, it actually leaves everyone susceptible to bad guys even more, <laughs> especially people who get targeted by um, different governments or people who get targeted by different groups or even their abusive partner. Um, so you have to really think about these things when you're talking about and framing things as we're trying to save the children, we're trying to save um, you know, people from mass amounts of crime, they're trying to save them and, and help them um, uh, not be targeted by the bad guys. But for the most part, if you break encryption for everyone, you actually make everyone more susceptible to said bad guys. And so I talk about this framing, the FBI actually monitored, um, heavily monitored Freddie Gray protests with spy planes. And this was really like unprecedented in a certain way because of the type of aircraft that was deployed, um, the way that they had monitored people who were involved with the Freddie Gray protests. And these are people who weren't an extremist group. These are people who were out there trying to get justice for a particular person that was shot by police. And the fact that the FBI got involved and also framed them as the bad guys and tried to like push this narrative onto people exercising their right to protest, it makes you, it gives you pause when they make requests to break encryption. And, you know, so Black movements and encryption have, you know, developed a really close relationship because this technology is out there now for our usage and we can use it to organize with each other. And so this um, byline says that the civil rights activists sided with Apple against the FBI, Apple feud, but I would, wouldn't say that they sided with Apple. I would say that they are enforcing the notion that no company, no matter who controls the keys, should be um, saying yes to the FBI to just give a back door. And if that company is Apple or Google, then that's the company that you're going to go after to actually uphold their word because we've all know that we have the most experience here with CoIntel Pro. And we don't want to go back to that realm again where we have end-to-end -end encryption and then they're using quote unquote once again black extremist groups um to to kind of push towards this mass surveillance again in order to keep the public safe and so signal downloads have been way up and we don't want to um impede on those things because and, and encryption is for everyone it's not just for nerds it's for activists it's for journalists it's for people who are trying to organize and we want to be able to um, keep using these tools despite the fact that um, we we're being targeted and monitored for trying to organize for our rights. And so a lot of people may be out there, where, you know, th this group can be, I guess, can consider, you know, hackers in this group, right? And there's some people that have been making calls like Black-owned communication apps. But if you do make an app that's targeted towards our community, I also want you to know you will also be susceptible to law enforcement requests. So be very careful about creating stuff as well that, you know, have ETEE -E encryption because you will see requests come your way as well. And then you'll have to answer the same question that Apple has answered. Do we succumb to law enforcement or want that consequence? And also shout out to Crypto Harlem for teaching the community about Signal and Tor and other devices out there and tools. So my takeaways from this, um, you know, open protocols are very important. Interoperability with different systems are very important because obviously monopolistic communication companies are a single point of failure. Um, and and this uh, that's been a big thing for me when I did this research. I was like, wow, you know, this is kind of like the trend that I'm seeing because it's very easy to ask one entity versus many. So open protocols and interoperability with those protocols are very important because then other people can create their own systems outside of big tech or whoever in the future is considered too big to fail, right? And then Black movements have already always been monitored, but the main point of them was getting information out there quickly to the community. And so that was something for me to always consider is like, what is the safest, fastest way for me information to be spread? So I want people to think on these things and think about how our ancestors were, you know, surveilled, but also they used the technology at hand to get information to each other in order to keep each other safe. And they did such an amazing job, despite the fact that COINTELPRO was in full force in the 60s, right? So thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I hope you all learned a little something out of this. I try to merge in a little bit of hacker history here too, to kind of see the parallels. And I hope you also go out there and push for encryption or ETEE -E on normal communications for everyday lives. Thank you so much.